said you're gonna be an army man. I would kill anyone I could, you know, knowing whether they were innocent or not, just to make sure I wouldn't get killed. And that was my philosophy. Like, if I'd go into a village and have to kill 100, and pe 100 people just to make sure there was no one there to shoot me when I walked out, that's what I did. You didn't feel uh, morally you shouldn't carry out some of these orders? I felt whatever was in the best interest of my country was what was best, and that's how I was raised to believe. I think that, you know, what should be brought out is the horror of the everyday, the commonplace, what went on there. What's happened is the American public's been lied to. The army has come out. They didn't care what you were doing or how you were getting it. They wanted bodies. And that's where civilians came in also. I'm just here because it goes on and somebody's got to do something. And here I am, you know. Let it go down Vietnam. But they can't deny the testimony of all these dudes in the room. We were about five miles down the road where there were some Vietnamese children uh, at the gateway of the village. And they gave the old finger gesture, and it was just like response. The guys got up, including the lieutenants, and just blew all the kids away. That was my first day in Vietnam. Will you please tell my mother? I have yet to have been on an operation where I haven't gone through a village. I have yet. And I have yet to have gone on an operation where when I've gone through that village, that village was still standing. Everything is set on fire. My squad leader personally ignited the first two hooches and then just told us to take care of the rest. Will you please tell my mother? Tell my mother about the state I'm in. When they left the area, we found one dead baby, which was a young child, uh, very young, in his mother's arms. And we found we found a, a baby girl about three years old that were dead because these people were bored. Won't you please? Won't you please? Will you please forgive me for my sin? I just wanted you to know about it. So, our primary speaker tonight is Nick Terse. Um, his book, Kill Anything That Moves, The Real American War in Vietnam, that was published in 2013 by Henry Holt describes how widespread atrocities were, in fact, and how um, the Defense Department um, tried to suppress any um, internal investigations that had been carried out into those atrocities. So Nick Terse is author of The Complex. He's also managing editor for TomDispatch.com and a fellow at the Na Nation Institute. So Nick. You know, I, I never set out to write a, uh, a history of uh, atrocities in Vietnam, a history of Vietnamese civilian suffering. Uh, I never thought that I would spend uh, 10 years plunge into a subject like this. I, I really stumbled upon it, uh, and it was when I was a graduate student. I was uh, at Columbia University, and I was working on a study of post-traumatic stress disorder among U.S. Vietnam veterans. Uh, I was the lone representative of the humanities on this study, uh, the lone historian. Everyone else was an epidemiologist, biostatistician, social psychologist, psychiatrist. And my job was to go down to the National Archives and find hard data to match up with the interviews that we had, uh, very detailed, structured clinical interviews done with veterans about 10 years after the war as part of a congressionally mandated study. And I would go down, find records to match it up, make sure that uh, these men were at the, uh, where they uh, said they were at the, at the right time. And from there, you know, the project expanded some. Uh, I, I went and, and studied other records. And I'd go down for several weeks at a time. And on one of these trips, I was down there for about two weeks. And every research avenue that I pursued was a dead end. It was just you know, one brick wall after another. Finally, on my last day 
in the archives. I went to an archivist that I worked with on a regular basis and I said, look, I can't go back to my boss empty handed. I need something, at least a lead, or he's never going to send me back down here again. And the archivist thought about it for, you know, all of five seconds and then he asked me a question that ended up changing my life. He asked me if I thought that witnessing war crimes could cause post-traumatic stress. And I told him, you know, that's an excellent hypothesis. What do you have on war crimes? And he told me about a collection of files called the, uh, the Vietnam War Crimes Working Group files. They were uh, produced by the Department of the Army in the early 1970s. And I said, yeah, why don't you pull those for me? So he did. And within an hour, I was leafing through about 30 archival boxes filled with the military's own records reports of massacres, murder, rape, torture, assault, mutilation, reports from active duty GIs and recently returned veterans, and in some cases extremely large case files, the size of several phone books, uh, of investigations that were done by Army criminal investigators of these allegations. I looked at these documents and I, I realized very quickly that uh, that they weren't in the literature anywhere. And you know, I, I, I couldn't get them out of my head. And I, I, went, I went back home and I went to my boss and I said, you'll never believe what I found. I told him about the records. And he said to me what, uh, what any good epidemiologist does. He said, are they systematic? <laughs> and I said, well, no, you know, that's not how atrocities are reported. Very few ever bubble up to the point where they're investigated in any way. So he said, well, what do you propose we do with them? And I, you know, I throw up my hands. I, I, didn't, have a, I didn't have any idea. But, uh, but I couldn't forget about the documents. So I, I called up a couple of Vietnam War historians that I knew. And I said, you really ought to get down there and work with these documents. I said, these are important. Get down there. And everybody was onto another project or burnt out from their last project or, you know, it just wasn't right for them. And finally, one of them, who I, I really respected, said, you should write this. He said, you're young, and at the time I, I actually was. <laughs> and uh, he said, you'll have a fresh perspective. You should write this book, but go down there and get these records right away. Get a hold of the records and write the book right away. I said, okay. At this time, I was 200 pages into a different dissertation. So I went to my dissertation advisor. I said, this is what, what Chris told me, she said I should write this book right away. Do you think I can write this book and my dissertation at the same time? And he shook his head at me and he said, you know, you're, you're crazy. How are you going to do that? He said, if these records are that important, though, drop the other topic, shift over to this. So I said, oh, okay. You know, I, I, I respected him. I, I thought he was probably right. And he said, but, but Chris is right. Get those records right away. They're going to disappear if you don't. And I thought he was a little paranoid, but I, I really respected him. So I started thinking about it. I said, OK, I'll, I'll do that. But I was a graduate student at the time. I really didn't have the money to go copy these records. So I said, I think in six months, I could get together enough grant funding. I could probably do this. He shook his head again at me, and he reached into his desk, pulled out his checkbook, and wrote me out a check on the spot. In 24 hours, I was down at the National Archives copying these records. I'd go in in the morning and stand in front of that copy machine all day and copy until they threw me out at night. And I put all the money he gave me into the copying of the records. So I went to the archives parking lot and I slept in my car. Luckily, I, I kept my car like a pigsty in those days. So it was filled with uh, old newspapers, crumpled journal articles, assorted trash. So I crawl in the the back of the car, put a blanket over me, cover it with those newspapers, and then when the federal security guard came in at night and shined his, his flashlight, I held my breath and I tried to remain completely still, and it worked. Every morning I, I, had, a, I had a sign in front of the car that said, car broke down, tow truck coming tomorrow. <laughs> and every morning I'd move it to a different level, the, the parking garage, and they never caught on. Uh, I, I assume that wasn't the same guy working the night shift every night. So, uh, 
within uh, you know a few days, I, I had the whole collection copied, and I was driving back towards New York with uh, with the entire collection. And my advisor's uh, paranoia proved justified and, and, and not paranoid at all, because sometime after I wrote my first article from these uh, documents, they were pulled from the archive shelves, and they've never been available in the same way since. If you want to look at these records today, about 20% of them are available publicly at the National Archives, 80% are, have been reclassified, and you have to file a Freedom of Information Act request for each and every folder. The last time I checked, there was not a folder list, so unless you know the names of these folders, it's impossible to FOIA them up, so it's uh, it'd be impossible to replicate my work today. The archive says that they will declassify them at some point, but it's, it's been a decade now. So I wrote my dissertation from these, uh, these records. It was a monster 1,200-page tome. And after I defended it, I, uh, I went back and I read it, and something struck me. I said, where are the Vietnamese? I'd written it from US records, and only in the rarest of occasions did uh, military investigators go and talk to Vietnamese witnesses and survivors of these atrocities. So I knew if I ever turned this into a book that I would, uh, I'd have to get the Vietnamese side of the story. And I was, I was lucky that uh, I caught on with the LA Times right after I finished my dissertation. And I spent about a year and a half freelancing for them working strictly on project on, on war crimes. I took some of the marquee cases from these records and went to Vietnam and, uh, and tracked down witnesses there. So I would go into a, a rural hamlet with a big stack of documents in my hand, a big sheaf of documents. I went to talk about one specific massacre, a specific spasm of violence. But what the Vietnamese would tell me about time and again was what it was like to live for 10 years under bombs and artillery shells and helicopter gunships, about how they had to negotiate every aspect of their lives around what they call the American War. Now, I listened in Hamlet after Hamlet as they told me what it was like to have their house burned down four, five, six times before they finally gave up and started living a semi-subterranean existence in a bomb shelter. Again and again, I heard the same types of stories about the calculations that went on on a, on a constant basis. They would talk about what it was like to have artillery called in on the, on the rice paddies or on the hamlet, and everyone would run for the bomb shelters. Families would be huddled below ground, waiting. And then they would have to figure out, they'd have to make life or death decisions again and again. They knew that that was preparatory artillery fire. It meant that there would be ground troops coming in after. Americans landed by helicopter, coming in on foot. They had to figure out when to get out of that bunker. Of course, you had to outlast the artillery barrage and stay down there. But come out a second too early, you could get cut down by the machine gun from a helicopter overhead or get caught in the crossfire between the withdrawing guerrillas and the onrushing Americans. But a second too late could be no less lethal because American grenades would start rolling in. To the Americans, they weren't bomb shelters. They were possible enemy fighting positions. And they told me about this. They told me about what it was like to, to live down there and have to make these same choices every time that they went out to find water to drink or forage for vegetables for a, for a hungry family or try and farm the rice fields at night or even to, to relieve themselves. And I heard these stories again and again, and I realized that uh, the story that I wanted to tell wasn't one strictly of atrocities or war crimes, but it was a story of Vietnamese civilian suffering. I started to think about how much suffering that was, and I, then I thought about the numbers. Two million civilians killed, over five million wounded, using conservative estimate, 11 million made refugees, and that's the US government's own figures. Thinking about those numbers, thinking about this constant worry and uh, you know, uh, constant misery for days, weeks, months, years, 
I tried to grapple with that, and I had a, a very difficult time doing it. But I, I realized that uh, in the 30,000 or so books on the war that are out there, you know, there are very few that focus on civilians and very few that focus on this aspect of the war. So that's, that's what I, I set out to, uh, to write. I, I don't think, I think I still focus too much on, on the Americans and the, and the subtitle uh, tells you so, but, um, but I wanted to try and interject that into the literature. Now I realize that uh, I'm running short on time here, so I want to just backtrack to the war crimes working group documents that I found in the archives. When I found them on, on one level, I was really shocked uh, because they weren't in the literature anywhere. I figured that someone would have come across them before and, and, and worked with them. And I asked an archivist about this, and he said that uh, people had looked at one or two files, but never the whole collection. And uh, the reason being that this, this uh, war crimes working group was never on the books. It was run in secret out of the Army Chief of Staff's office. At that time, it was General William Westmoreland, who had been the top US commander in Vietnam just a couple years before. And he had put this group together. They were there not to investigate war crimes, to uh, prosecute war crimes, to send guidance into the field about preventing war crimes. What they were there to do was to track war crimes cases to make sure that the Army was never caught flat-footed again by an atrocity scandal. They didn't want a repeat of what had happened with My Lai. And they worked to tamp down and bury atrocity allegations whenever they could. And they ended up doing a, a, a very good job of it. They were very successful. So in that sense, you know, the, the records were a revelation. But uh, in another, you know, I, I had a, a framework to understand them. Because I, I looked at the, the crimes, and I said, this is exactly what uh, you know, there are hundreds and hundreds of anti-war veterans uh, came home and, and spoke out about in the, uh, in the late 60s and early 1970s, and most famously at the Winter Soldier investigation, which took place uh, in uh, late January, early February of 1971 in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, there, 125 uh, veterans, more than 125, uh, representing all the major uh, combat units to serve in Southeast Asia during the war. Uh, assembled to give direct uh, testimony about the atrocities they had witnessed or, in some cases, perpetrated. And uh, we're fortunate that a, a group of uh, 18 up-and-coming filmmakers uh, saw, you know, had the, had the vision to see that this was an important event uh, and, and to go there and film this. And they shot it in, uh, in stark black and white on, on grainy, uh, film. It has a, a, a fantastic texture to it. And they kept a, a tight focus, you know, literally and figuratively, on these veterans, uh, tight in on their, on their, their young faces. And, um, you know, I, I think you'll find that uh, even today, you know, four decades after the film uh, premiered at, uh, at the Cannes Film Festival, that the, that the film retains its ability to shock and, and sadden all these decades later. Uh, it's a testament to their work and a testament to the men who, who came forward there and spoke out. Now, one of the veterans in this movie had a, uh, a, pr a profound effect on my work and on my life. Uh, I was lucky enough to call him a friend during the last years of his life before he succumbed to uh, cancers linked to Agent Orange. Uh, I'm happy to talk about him later, but uh, I think it's better right now to listen to him and his fellow veterans in their own words in a documentary that the Washington Post called Dazzling, Unforgettable, and Profound. So thank you. I'd like to welcome our panelists, please, up to the front. It's been a long time um, since I've seen this film. Uh, I've seen Nick's book very recently, though. And they make terrific bookends on a horrible history. Uh, but sitting through the, the, the film again raises questions in my mind that just that have no answer. Some observations that can float in the air and drift away, I suppose. But if there's any reaction to them, I guess I certainly would find it interesting. Um, random things that don't really grow out of the, the, the script that we've just heard and seen. It's often said that the generals fight the last war. 
And the implication of that phrase is that they learn lessons from the last war and they apply them in the next war where they're obsolete so they don't work. And in thinking about the whole issue of war crimes and atrocities and terror against civilians, terror as a means of warfare, in some cases a very effective one, I was thinking, no, that isn't it. Generals don't plan to fight the last war. They have only one war model and they pre prepare to fight it over and over and that's what gives us atrocities and war crimes in every war. The only difference between wars on this, in, in this uh, area being the scale of the war crimes. Sometimes they're monstrous, sometimes they're just sort of scattered, but they're always there. And one question that, that comes out of that observation is if they were as great in scale as we now know them to be in the case of Vietnam, what was it about Vietnam? the situation, the character of the warfare, the character of the army we sent there that produced war crimes on such a scale compared to other wars where they are lesser. I don't think they ever completely go away. I'm intrigued by the idea that an army's commission of war crimes on such a scale that it begins to eat away at the moral fiber of the troops, troops themselves was at least part of the reason for the, 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 the slow moving collapse of American armed forces in Vietnam from about 1970 onward, which Nick discusses in his book, in a really fine job of it. It's well documented, it's not an original observation, it's all out there that things just began to go south piece by piece and it was one of the factors that, were, that, that pushed Nixon and Kissinger and the Joint Chiefs of Staff to want to get out of the war. They realized that the Army was sort of disintegrating underneath them and they only had a fixed amount of time to bring it home before something very bad happened, possibly domestically inside the country, possibly in Vietnam. But to what extent did that erosion of the, of the fighting man's moral fiber caused the collapse, and I, I hadn't really thought about it. I think it was huge, actually. Uh, and that was what made it ultimately self-defeating. Uh, it is, terror is a very effective way of fighting insurgencies. You have to do a whole lot of killing though to make it work, but there are a lot of examples of it throughout history, in particular in our own movement west. It works, but the problem is you have to and to kill the civilians faster than your own moral fiber disintegrates. And if those things are out of sync, it works against you and you've got serious problems. Well, we did in Vietnam. And if I come out with a new edition of my book, uh, someday, probably not. But if I ever did, I, I would explore that in greater detail. Let me leave one last thought, a very pessimistic thought. I, I can't avoid the thought, too, that our atrocities in Vietnam, our war crimes in Vietnam will never come to trial. There will never be a, an official public acknowledgement of what was done. We will never be dragged before the International Court of Justice. This just won't happen. And it, it, the reason I think is quite simple, uh, it's because uh, we lost the war strategically, but we didn't lose on the battlefield and our own country wasn't occupied. In that sense, we weren't the losers. Uh, the, the South Vietnamese, for lack of a better term, were the people who orbited around the old Saigon government were the, the only real losers. We, we wreaked a lot of destruction and left. And uh, it's the only people who are penalized for war crimes are people who lose their, their countries or they live in very weak countries. So in these days, the international court can reach into them and pull them out one by one and bring them back to the Hague and, and, and try them and so forth. Uh, but that's just not going to happen to the United States. The other reason, it's a great power and great powers are special and there's only one great power in, in the world. There's been only one, arguably only one since 1945, uh, certainly only one since 1989, and that's the United States.
and the, a, a great power is a country that is essential to maintaining peace and stability around the world. Odd, strange phrase. That would take a lot of time to explain, but it's true. The, the great power is kind of a global policeman, and it performs this function of peacekeeping on a global scale with the, the assent of most of the world community because it is still an international system in which there's no enforceable law. Who enforces the law such as it is? The country that has the capacity to do it, that's us. And we have to be given a long leash to perform this function for the world. And so the world, frankly, is not gonna to get too upset about our war crimes in Vietnam. They're gonna be forgotten by the world, not only by us. And of course, we do want to forget, don't we? And I would explain why I forgot way too long if I had time, but I think it's time for me to shut up. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Uh, Nick, would you like to make a, a few comments, maybe relating your work to the, to the film? Well, there, there's, there's, there's a lot there to, uh, you know, one, one thing that, that struck me when you were saying that, uh, you know, this is, that the, the atrocities and, uh, and targeting civilians is, you know, uh, uh, it's part and parcel of war. And I, I think that's right. I don't think there are wars without atrocities. Uh, I'd just like to, to make the point that um, the, the wholesale killing of civilians uh, is especially a hallmark of, of modern wars. Uh, you know, if, if you look at, uh, you know, up until World War I, troops on the battlefield generally bore the, the brunt of, of warfare, at least in, in modern era. Uh, since World War II, it's civilians that have overwhelmingly been the, the victims of war. Uh, you know, those, those generals saw their armies chewed up on the, on the battlefields in Europe, and it's, it's almost as if they vowed, you know, never again. And since then, war has been brought to civilians. And, you know, since World War II, we're talking about extremely heavy firepower. Uh, and the United States put a lot of money into uh, anti-personnel weapons in the time after World War II, especially in response to uh, the Korean War and the experience there, uh, coming up with weapons that, that maim, like cluster bombs, uh, weapons that have uh, extremely small fragments, make it difficult to, uh, you know, to, to save people, especially in austere conditions, uh, as in Vietnam. So I think, uh, you know, we, we had since World War II a, a you know, a, a perfect storm of horrors that, uh, you know, became acceptable to target civilians and, uh, and the weaponry that was used was uh, you know, ghastly weapons, anti-personnel weapons, uh, cluster bombs, napalm, high explosives. I was uh, not an officer, I was this uh, E-5 enlisted and um, when I came back, uh, I was an interrogator linguist, when I came back, uh, I got involved with the anti-war movement, specifically Vietnam Veterans Against the War. And I was here locally, I was a regional coordinator for Vietnam Veterans Against the War, and, and as an anti-war activist, I showed this film in 16 millimeter film, oh, I don't know, I saw it maybe a dozen or so times. And I'm, even after all these years, I'm amazed at how uh, um, contemporary it is, really. And I think it's got a lot of these things that these, these veterans, my comrades, said is very, very applicable to the way that we, we still fight our wars and uh, uh, recently Afghan and Iraq. We still fight it the same way. And uh, our more modern weapons are drones and, and guided missiles, but it, the, the end result is, is uh, uh, civilian casualties. And Nick's right about the uh, Americans have fought wars with uh, overwhelming overwhelming firepower, we've considered, continued to do that, but the, um, the net result of that are a lot, lot more civilian casualties. But I'd also like to mention some of the things that Nick did, and that is that had not Nick and others made these things public, and had not these Vietnam veterans and winter film made this public, you know, there's a lot less, it amazingly would not be known about Vietnam. And, uh, if history isn't written, and this is a form of writing, uh, film and, and uh, books, it doesn't exist. I mean, um, people might disagree with that, but I mean, I, when I was a history uh, student here, uh, 
and listening to a history professor, and it was a medieval history, and um, somebody asked the uh, professor, well, what about these 16th century or 15th century villagers and their life? He says, what do we know about them? He says, well, if it wasn't written, it didn't exist. But this exists, and the written record is, is, is uh, you know, it, it's really, a, uh, I think, an optimistic thing because the cat's out of the bag. Um, when I was a, uh, uh, in, in Vietnam during the Tet Offensive and the May Offensive also, uh, the village right next to us was literally blown away. There were um, oh, four or 500 uh, people in there. And uh, I gave Nick a card, one of my cards, that a uh, comrade of mine, Wayne Goble, and as part of the history, really, uh, of, of the war, he made an audio recording of this, these airstrikes that went on for, oh, two hours or so, and then a written text of that. Uh, and as a result of that, you know, that, that, that destruction of uh, several hundred Vietnamese civilians that I saw and the rest of my company saw is now a matter of the public record. When I went back uh, as an intelligence analyst and, and looked at the record of what this, what this happened the next week or so, it didn't exist. There was other situation reports, so-called. It didn't exist. Uh, when a friend of mine who's actually applied for uh, PTSD compensation because he saw a bunch of civilians killed, and particularly some uh, children, the Army said, well, that incident that you talked about didn't exist. It's not in our records. But thanks to what these veterans did and what Nick has done, it exists. And it's a fact, and you can't deny it. And, and that's a very, very important thing going forward. Thank you. Yes. Thanks very much, Mike. And we should, we should note that, in fact, the testimony was entered into the congressional record. So it is yeah. actually yeah. part of the official record as a result of the Hatfield hearings, I believe. That was into the um, into war crimes. So um, I'd like to have a discussion amongst the panelists now, but I have one question that I don't know, maybe um, Bill, you could answer this. It's a puzzle to me, given the way that quite early on in the US involvement in, in Vietnam was a recognition that this was a war for hearts and minds. Very briefly, uh, I don't think that the, well, the phrase hearts and minds is it's a throwaway line and uh, it uh, from very early on people would use the throwaway line but it didn't represent policy it didn't and it certainly didn't represent what was actually being done on the ground until rather late in the war well is 60 after Tet, frankly mm -hmm. after 68 and um, its institutional home was not the Army, it was the CIA. Mm -hmm. And the CIA didn't have the clout that the Army had. Right. So you really have to think about what was the Army doing. And my short answer to that is the same thing that explains why the banks screwed up in 2008, explains why the US Army uh, didn't get the message mm -hmm. for virtually the whole war all large organizations to make sure that people do what their bosses want them to do have to have performance criteria. The key performance criteria was body count, mm -hmm. as Nick has made very right. clear, and it motivates people from the top to the bottom to behave in certain ways. Mm -hmm. Not all of them, all of the time, but it puts just sort of constant downward pressure for the mm -hmm. organization to do the things that the Army did. And what would it have taken to change the army, but have it turn on a dime, to behave in a radically different way, mm -hmm. such as would have been required to wage the war in a more bottom-up kind of way, win the hearts right. and minds, whatever right. that might have been. And it just wasn't gonna happen. Right. Just, and it didn't, right. it didn't. Yeah. Of course, Vietnam wasn't fought uh, like, uh, like World War I, where we had two armies facing off across a defined battlefield. Uh, as, as was mentioned in the movie, there wasn't a, you weren't trying to take territory. They were in they were at the allied nation of South Vietnam. You weren't trying to capture an enemy capital. And uh, so you, you, they, the military structure had to come up with some, uh, some metric uh, 
to show that they're making progress, that they're winning the war. And uh, it's important to remember this is Robert McNamara's Pentagon. He's the Secretary of Defense. He had, uh, in World War II, he had systematized the U.S. bombing, made it more effective, that is, more lethal. Uh, and after that, he had gone to work at uh, Ford Motor Company and employed systems analysis and, uh, you know, the early computers and uh, a heavy reliance on, uh, on, on numbers, on data, on crunching data. And, you know, they came up with a lot of different uh, methods of analysis for, for Vietnam, but it, but it really all boiled down to this one metric of body count. It came down from the Pentagon through Westmoreland's uh, villa in Saigon and trickled down into the field. And there, there were carrots and sticks employed. The sticks being that uh, these troops had a tremendous amount of, uh, of pressure put on them. Uh, if you didn't come in with a, a high body count, that meant you had to stay out in the field. Uh, you were, uh, had a much greater chance of being killed or wounded out there, or you're courting exhaustion or shattered morale. If you did produce bodies, uh, as we heard, a three-day pass to the beach resort at Vung Tau, uh, extra beer, hot food, lighter duty at base camp, uh, non-regulation gear, medals, badges, I heard all these things with uh, you know, hundreds of veterans that I talked to in preparation for this book. Uh, so you had, uh, you had carrots or sticks there at, at, the, at the, the level of the ground pounders and the, the junior officers just above them. They had six months in what they would call the, the crucible of combat, six months to prove yourself, to win promotion. Uh, if the Army was going to be your career, you know, you, you had a, a very short window. And this was your, your shot of it during the war. And, uh, and they had commanders that were, were bearing down on them. And, you know, there were some generals, uh, one of them I talk about in, in my book, uh, Julian Ewell, who were absolute fanatics about body count. But, uh, but the, you know, I mean, the entire military structure was predicated on that. And I, th I think it would have been, you know, impossible to, to really turn the army on a dime. This, this was the way the military was built. And there weren't a lot of other answers at their disposal. I mean, what they had was firepower. And they didn't have a lot more answers. And generally, they just applied more firepower when, when they weren't winning to, to try and win the war. Yeah, the, the other thing was that, uh, or point that I'd like to make is that in the early 60s or so, um, most of the senior NCOs in the Army and Marine Corps and a lot of these uh, mid-level and uh, senior officers were World War II and Korean veterans. And uh, just how hard some of these people were, um, I didn't realize it really until the end of my tour. But when I was first there, I, I ran across this uh, Sergeant Major, which is a senior, the most senior enlisted rank in the Army anyway. He was a Special Forces Sergeant Major, we were major, and we were in a club, or a little uh, drinking establishment, and getting drunk. He was pretty drunk. He had actually jumped at Normandy, so he, by that time, in 67, had been in the Army probably 25 years or so. And uh, I told him that I was a military intelligence and interrogator, and he just sort of looked at me, kind of a blank look at his face, and he said, well, uh, intelligence. And he said, well, I, I don't know about that. He says, all I do is kill him. And, and uh, I, I didn't realize how accurate and uh, present that was until I went through my tour. Uh, the Americans lost 14,000 soldiers dead in Vietnam the year I was there, November 67, 68. We probably killed 10, that, 10 or 20 times that many Vietnamese. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, watching this village get destroyed. Uh, so, I mean, the, the war was, was from the get-go, in my opinion, how many people do we kill? And uh, the, we, had, we had some very, the wars in, in Korea particularly were a very, very ugly, vicious war, and we had some really hard, hard soldiers. They passed that on, I think, to the way the war was fought. And once you get, a, a, once you get into a, a unit and they're doing things this way, you don't change things. You sort of do it that way, you know. That's it's that's very very common in the military. Add something very quick to that. Um, in the uh, in in the uh, uh, D-Day, the landing of Normandy, uh, the landing forces caused seventy-five thousand French civilian deaths. 
And these men were hard not only in that they believed that the killing was the way you won the war, but they were willing to inflict very high civilian casualties to win it, and they did that in World War II, but those are casualties that the French government, frankly, also kind of forgot. It's there in the history book, but, but, but the French haven't protested about it because we saved them, or something. I, uh, yeah. And there is a, a sergeant, uh, Roy Bumgarner, and he had served uh, in China at the end of World War II. Then he had gone to Korea and served two tours there, and then, uh, and then to Vietnam. So an old soldier. He'd been kicked out of the Marine Corps in the 1950s. He'd, uh, he'd been court-martialed four or five times. So he was kicked out. He enlisted in the Army. And he went to Vietnam, and he racked up. You know, his commanding officer set a personal body count of 1,500. This was, I think, after his fourth, fourth tour. Now, Roy Bumgarner was, uh, there were a lot of rumors that swirled around him that he killed civilians and then called them in as enemy dead. And uh, he was investigated at, at one point, and they said that the, the man making the allegation, he was a 19-year-old kid, was a malcontent, a troublemaker, and uh, they let Bumgarner off. And then, uh, they were in a, a village in, in Bindin, and Bumgarner uh, detained three civilians, uh, had them sit under a tree, and he and, uh, and another you know, 19, 20-year-old opened fire on them, killed them. They brought weapons into the field and, uh, and planted them on the bodies. But one of the men in the unit uh, who was policing up the, the dead took the, the civilian ID cards off of these uh, innocents that they had killed, and he brought them back in, and uh, Bumgarner was actually uh, tried. He was uh, at, at court-martial and convicted. Uh, during the court-martial transcript, he said that this was a training mission, and it came out that this is, this is what he was doing. I mean, he was an old soldier. He was training these men, and there was an aura about him that he was a superman because he, he had this tremendous body count. He was convicted, and... Uh, sentenced. He spent, uh, what was it, six months his pay was docked and he was busted down to private but they allowed him to stay in Vietnam. He re-enlisted and he fought in Vietnam for the next three years until 1972. Finally, you know, the, the infantry was just whittled down to almost nothing so he was forced to go home. But uh, I always shudder to think about, you know, those years after and all the other troops that he trained, and all of those before, because this was, uh, this was his MO. He was caught once, but you know, the Army knew what they had on their hands, but they just let him go on fighting the war his way and training other men to fight the war that way. Yeah, you hear about what it was mentioned in the SOP, Standard Operating Procedure, and that's what it was. And as I, I mentioned earlier, I sort of want to uh, um, say it again, but once you get this way of doing things, it's passed down from, you know, company to company to company to rotation to rotation to rotation. And one of the reasons that Me Lai happened was the Americal Division had a long history of this kind of thing. Bad officers, bad NCOs, this kind of shit happened all the time. And the more that happened in units, the more likely they were to do this sort of thing. Um, that's the way the war was fought. Well, let's see. Well, I'm going to open it up for questions. I see someone right at the back over here. Well, you know, the, the first thing you mentioned was, uh, was the casualties, or the Vietnamese killed. And of course, we're, we're never going to have very good numbers on that. Uh, the, the, best, the best study that I've seen was done uh, maybe 2008 or so. It's Harvard Medical School and, uh, and, the, and University of Washington, yeah. I think, yeah. Uh, and they came up with uh, 3.8 million uh, violent war deaths, I believe it was. But it was uh, uh, combatants and non-combatants. And uh, it was the, the Vietnamese government uh, in the late 90s came up with a figure of, of 2 million. And if you look at the, uh, the, the casualty figures for the, uh, the Vietnamese Revolutionary Forces and the, the Arvin, and you subtract them, it, it comes out to roughly Two million. I, I think it's, you know, 
we'll never have real good figures, but somewhere in that range, say between one and, and two million. Uh, you mentioned fragging. You know, the, the, the military, you know, the, the Army did release some numbers on that uh, back during the war. I think they were always, uh, you know, there was some deflation on the, on the numbers that were released. There was a book by, I think, George Lepre, I think that's, or it's, it's spelled L-E-P-R-E, -E, called Fragging. It came out within the last couple years. It's the most comprehensive look that I've seen on, on fragging. I don't know if you fellas have seen anything else. And the last point was, sorry. Homeless veterans. Homeless veterans. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, a, a, a persistent problem, which, you know, of course, we've, we've just added to, uh, to this problem with the, the recent wars and the, the burdens on the, uh, the VA. It's, uh, I mean, a, a constant problem that the, the government now is, you know, they, they, they seem to be throwing, you know, anything at it that they can, uh, you know, video games and things like that to, uh, to, to overcome PTSD. You know, that's in, in, instead of, you know, not, uh, you know, not engaging in military adventurism around the world. So uh, it's going to be a problem that's with us. And, uh, you know, the, the resources, they, they just won't, uh, you know, they, they just won't free up the necessary resources for it. Uh, as far as, uh, you know, casualties, the Vietnamese government estimates there's somewhere between 300,000 and 700,000 missing in action. Compare that to our, our, our MIAs, or you know, which are we admit to maybe a couple of thousand. And that puts that in some sort of perspective. Uh, the other thing about PTSD and Vietnam veterans and, and uh, homelessness is that I actually had uh, I, I've got PTSD, and I actually got some help from the VA. And one of the things that the uh, psychologist that I talked to said, he said the number of Vietnam veterans who are taking trying to get some care from the VA has yet to peak. This was a year or two, two years ago. He says, it just keeps going up. So until we're all dead, that'll probably keep going up. And Nick is right. He says, the, the, the number of people that are going to be damaged from Iraq and Afghanistan, you're talking people who have done up to seven or eight or 10 tours. They all have PTSD with all the other problems that are. And the government refuses to fund the VA fully. It's always cap in hand for the VA to get funding, and that's uh, it's a problem that's going to get a lot worse. And everybody here who's under 40 or 50, you're going to be paying for those, uh, paying for those people for the rest of your lives. I'd like to ask you directly, don't you think that nothing has changed? We have this exact same war system, and the only thing that's changed is that we're in a cool interwar period where the population now is in the forgetting process, the healing process, and then we'll just have another big million-death war in about another five or ten years. What's changed? Well, I don't know, but I mean, when the, pe the, the pre-invasion of Iraq protests worldwide, we're talking about tens of millions of people that protested. There were 30,000 people on the streets here in Seattle alone. Uh, there were a lot of people who thought that this was a bad, bad idea, but the, the die was cast. George Bush and his pals had said, we're going to do this. And um, you know, and we, until we start electing some people who are sane, I don't know if that's going to change. The other thing is that, and, and I'm sorry, we alluded to this about the, you know, the military personnel, the, um, and, and Nick and Nick and um, our professor here, yeah. Bill, <laughs> Bill <laughs> sorry, uh, talked about this a little bit earlier, and that's the way the changing the way the military uh, operates, the way they think, and that's not going to change until actually the civilians start exercising some control over the military. Uh, I can think of a lot of countries that, that don't have this package of problems, veterans uh, without homes or having PTSD, uh, who are not agonizing over recently committed war crimes through a string of wars. I, I don't think that's a problem in Denmark or, or Italy. Uh, I, I wish it were a problem in Japan, but it, I guess it's not. Uh, it, it, at least it's not in Japan for, 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 for uh, younger Japanese. Uh, it's not a problem, I, and it go on and on. There are very, very few countries in the world for whom this is a, actually there's only one. Serbia. 
Possibly. I guess we could throw in a couple there, you know. But the basic reason that we have this bundle of problems, uh, and which I tend to agree with you, are going to come back down the road as we forget the, the latest wars, as they disappear into to history and are forgotten and so forth. And we get a new generation of, of bright young things that haven't had that experience and haven't been raised by veterans and and uh, who go to school and learn that their 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 books about about the exceptionalism of the, the experience of being American, where the country that holds the beacon of democracy and freedom around the world and all sorts of fine values, those people are going to be susceptible to uh, and going to want to support uh, a country uh, which uh, which strides boldly across the face of the earth as the U.S. has done since the end of World War II. It gives Americans enormous psychological satisfaction to be citizens of the world's greatest power. And yes, they're feeling really bruised and down right now. But that feeling will slide into the past and we'll be back where we were unless we give up that role or somebody replaces us. The leading power of the world across history has always had this package of problems. Britain during the 19th century. France before that, United States today. So we don't need a, well, social revolution would be one way. That would be one way. Another way, though, would be to step back from our responsibilities as a global power. Let the Chinese take over. Let them do it. <laughs> I'd like to get back to the, the, the Department of Defense um, project to commemorate the war and you know oh, yeah. some critiques that this is going to be a whitewash and it seems that you know if we were to learn anything <coughs> or if if we were to actually engage in a serious evaluation of these wars that perhaps we could even go on being the world's policeman but to do it in a better way or you seem to indicate that that wouldn't be possible but what is the role of this this department of the department of D defense initiative is it to commemorate the war. What, what's going to come of that? And, and what, are, what are people's concerns on the panel for that? Well, one thing I noticed in, in looking at that website, uh, I noticed that the military is still playing by the, the same playbook that they did uh, 40 years ago. I, I looked at, uh, they have a, a history and education section, which is geared towards the general public and then they make a special push for grades 7 through 12 and have educational materials. And the, the hallmark of the site is their timeline. It's uh, something like 722 entries uh, spanning from uh, the, the first American encounters with uh, Vietnam in, in the 1800s up to 1976. I think that timeline cuts off. And I went and I, I looked, I was interested to see what they had for the My Lai entry. And I noticed that uh, they call it the My Lai Incident. It's not the My Lai Massacre. Yeah. And I remembered that uh, when General William Pierce, who, who conducted the investigation of My Lai for the Army, and it's, it's an exceptionally well done investigation, and I think probably unprecedented in the, the annals of military history, at least up until that time. Uh, Pierce was told in, in no uncertain terms when they announced uh, they announced the findings of the study. He was told that he couldn't call it a massacre at his press conference. He had to call it an incident. And I see they're, they're still using that today. They said that it was a massacre of uh, more than 200 civilians. Uh, and they've always you know, uh, downplayed the numbers there. The real number is more than 500 civilians were killed at My Lai over a period of four hours. They mentioned that, uh, that there was a uh, uh, one, one member of the AmeriCal Division, the 23rd Infantry Division, who was convicted, and they have a picture of Lieutenant Callie there, but they don't, they don't mention him by name. But there's an implication there that there's one man responsible for, for this. Like, like one person could have killed 500 civilians, or even the, the 200 that they're, they're claiming it is. Uh, you know, it's, they don't offer any context. And, and, and this, is a, I mean, this is a hallmark of the, the timeline. There's just no context there. And if you, you go through, I mean, it's, it's a very stilted history. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's the line the military's been pushing all these years. I could, I could go on with other examples, but this is, um, 
you know, this is yeah, I'm glad basically you how it's set up. I'm glad you raised that one because I was hoping someone would bring up the My Lai inquiry because, in fact, that's the, that is obviously the, the, the massacre about which we know the most because it was leaked basically to the press. And um, the army was put on the spot to actually investigate it. And the Piers inquiry is a, is a devastating indictment of um, showing how, in fact, you know, the responsibility for this is, does begin at the highest levels that orders were given that this was, you know, a free fire zone, that, that anyone left in the village was probably going to be the enemy, um, and that the troops were ill-trained in the Geneva Convention. They knew nothing about the, the rules of war. So it really is a damning indictment. It is. Uh, you know, and, and you mentioned that the, the orders there. I mean, uh, Captain Medina, Cali's commanding officer, the night before, told these men, and this is the recollection of the, the men who were at the briefing, to kill everything that moved. And uh, that was the answer to a question of, well, what about women and children? Yeah. Kill everything that moved. So, I mean, these are orders coming down for a captain. There were, uh, uh, you know, superior officers uh, flying overhead in helicopters. You know, the peers inquiry found uh, you know, 228 breaches of the laws of war. And, uh, you know, and but but only Cali was ever convicted of these crimes. He, he had plenty of blood on his hands. You know, make no mistake about that. But uh, but they, you know, it's obvious that they targeted the the lowest ranking officer they could to shoulder the blame. And Medina too, who had also killed. Yeah. Um, just just a couple of quick quick comments, and that is, um, despite what these guys saying, and uh, you know what what happened at Milai. I don't know what the percentage is of Vietnamese civilians' deaths by bombings or artillery. I think most, most of them died by that. Uh, uh, free fire zones, rockets, uh, mortars, artillery. And my personal knowledge of the war, what, that's what I saw. I mean, I was out with field units from time to time, but most of the damage I saw was from, from this sort of anonymous banal, routine way the war was fought. And um, that's the way we still fight our wars. In fact, that's the way it's going. That's what the drones are for.